think we'll get started. I got a lot to cover today, so uh, probably need all my, my full time allotment. Um, thank you for coming. It's 4.20 p.m. Uh, thank you for skipping your smoke breaks to come to this talk. Um, all right, so let's talk about having your memory usage with 12 weird tricks. Uh, the, the 11th one will shock you. Uh, my name is Nate Berkepeck. I run an independent one-man consultancy I'm calling Speed Shop. Um, I work on people's Ruby and Rails applications to try to improve their performance and scalability. Um, so let's talk about memory. Um, so the inspiration for this talk was that I'd say a good amount of the people that come to me um, and, uh, to fix their, their, their Ruby applications performance have memory issues. Um, and even if they don't come to me for that, I usually have to fix the memory issues first. Um, and also, like, I'm, I'm very active in, in reading the Puma and Sidekick GitHub uh, repositories. And if you look at any of those repositories, especially Sidekick, um, maybe 90% of the issues that have to do with memory and say, my, my app uses too much memory. I switched to Puma, now I have a memory leak. Or I switched to Sidekick, and now I use 300 gigabytes of memory. About 90% of them are not actual leaks or bugs, but just misunderstandings of how uh, Ruby works with memory. So part of this talk is gonna be about talking about all these misconceptions and correcting them and, uh, and then providing you some solutions to fix the, the real problems that you have. Um, so we think we're leaking memory all the time, but really we're not. Um, Ruby, the, the thinking I think goes like this. Ruby is a garbage collected language, but my memory is going up, therefore that must be a memory leak. Uh, and that's just not the case. Um, I think as Ruby programmers, we're allowed not to think about memory. And, and that's a good thing. Like, thank God we don't have to, to, to call malloc and free on our own. Otherwise we'd all be C programmers. Uh, so I think it's, it's okay and expected that as Ruby programmers, we have a lot of, we, we don't really understand what's happening um, at the memory level. Um, so this is Puma's top issue ever um, in terms of, of comments. is 100, 172 comments about memory usage going up over time. Um, and this is, this, I want you to remember the shape of this graph because it's very interesting about this, this guy thought he had a, a memory leak or memory problem. And this thread is really interesting. It's, it's just dozens of people talking about how they switched to Puma and now they have a memory leak or they switched to Puma and now they're, they're Processes are using four gigabytes of memory, and Unicorn didn't do that, so there must be a problem with Puma. Um, so solution one um, of our 12 solutions here is just to dial back the amount of application instances, because a lot of the people in that thread didn't actually have any idea of uh, how much memory one instance of their application used. And this is pretty common. People hit um, an R14 error on Heroku, um, or they are um, hitting the, the memory uh, limits on their AWS instance, or they're using a worker killer that kills workers after a certain amount of, of memory is used. And they never really find out that if you just left this application running for 24 hours or 18 hours, how much memory would it use after that amount of time? Does the memory usage ever level off? People just look at too short an amount of time when they're looking at how much memory does this process use. Um, so what we first need to do is dial back the number of instances we're using so that we are not, A, hitting any worker killer limits, and so we're not um, hitting the limits of our, of our server, our container, or whatever. Because um, if you are doing either of those things, you do not know how much uh, memory you're actually using um, in the long term. Um, and it, so we're, we're, it's bizarre to me, like how many Ruby applications I see that are like literal sinking ships like, their they're, they're, they're application's on fire, they're running out of memory, but like, it, it's so easy to fix that problem, you just turn it down. Like, you turn down how much memory pressure you're, or you're, you're doing, right? I, I very rarely come up against someone's application that said they had an out of memory error, and they were already running just a single instance of their application in a container. And what I'm talking about when I talk about instances, right, is uh, Puma workers, uh, Unicorn, I think, calls them workers or something like that. Uh, each forked process of your application, right? Not talking about threads here, um, because threads share memory, right? The processes sort of only sh share memory. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, so the myth here is that memory usage should just look like a long, flat line. 
Um, memory usage should never grow in the, in the steady state. Um, and the reality, and this is, this, is, so this is what people think Ruby memory curves should look like. The reality is they look like this. They look like, they look like logarithms. And there's, it, there's so much important information about like, what's going on here, right? So this section, so we're talking about the first two hours or so after your application starts up. Uh, code is getting required, okay? Not everything gets required at boot. Like Rails tries to do that, but maybe your libraries don't. Maybe your application code is getting required. Things like that. So code's getting required. That's going to increase our memory usage. Um, we are uh, filling up caches. Even if you don't do application caching, which, shame on you, you should, uh, you might be filling up caches like Rails um, adequate record cache, which was introduced in uh, Rails 4.2. You could be filling up connect, creating connection pools to the database. Um, all these things create objects, create memory. It takes a while for those things, all those code paths to get hit under production load. Um, so you're going to see memory increase during the first hour or two for that reason. Uh, and finally, um, it, different actions in your application require different amounts of memory, right? The simple ones maybe only allocate a couple thousand objects. The complicated ones allocate 200 megabytes worth of objects. Um, and as those complicated paths get hit, you're going to see uh, the amount of memory usage grow, right? Because Ruby needs a bigger heap to process that action. Okay, so that's, that's why that we, we see that sharp increase in the first couple hours after, after starting a Ruby application. Um, and then when we get to the end here, you'll notice it doesn't really ever, ever, ever level out, okay? And we're gonna get to why that happens in a minute, but I don't want you to expect that a steady state Ruby application will somehow never grow in memory usage. And, and I should say it in, in um, caveat here, I'm talking about MRI, I'm talking about CRuby, and this talk is very CRuby focused, I'm not talking about JRuby, sorry if you came here and you have a JRuby application because I'm not sure how much of, of what I talk about with memory is going to be relevant to you, uh, but I think most of us are running MRI in production, so that's why I've tailored the talk to this. Um, the other problem with, with, with this logarithm memory curve, right, is you can look at any portion of this curve and look at a very small portion, so you're looking at memory usage over 30 minutes or an hour or whatever, uh, it looks like a short, sharp, linear line, right? Like, it, it, you look at just memory usage for one hour from here to here, it looks like, oh, it's growing like crazy, I have a leak. You don't ever see the full logarithm. So that's why it's so important to let a Ruby process grow over 18, 24 hours. And, and again, this depends on um, how much load you're under, right? So the, the less load you have, the longer you have to wait to see the, uh, your true steady state memory usage. If you have a, some, if you're like Shopify or whatever, I mean, it takes like 20 minutes because you have a million requests coming into each instance. So um, it depends on your load. But for most people, I think, you really need to be waiting like 12 to 18 hours. And the problem with, with worker killers, right, is we have this hard memory cap that the worker killer imposes. And if you set that cap too low, you're killing the Ruby process before it ever has a chance to get to a steady state, okay? So if, this line here is at a gig, and the true steady state of your instance is two gigs. You're killing it after one, and they see this sharp, you see this sharp curve in your memory usage graph, right? So it goes up and it goes down, and you think, oh, it's this super sharp, intense curve. I must have a leak. But you're not looking at the full curve. You're not letting it live long enough to, to, to prove that you have a leak. So my, my recommendation, this is a very general sort of um, uh, all one size fits all thing is you should be aiming for 300 megabytes per instance. And this is for your general Rails application. It's probably gonna be a lot less if you're, you know, some rack application that's like bare metal, just like serving an API or whatever. But for most Rails applications, I think 300 megabytes is a good goal. Um, I've seen as far north as 600 per instance. That's not great. Um, but you should be aiming for 300. And that also applies to Psychic. Psychic has to load your application code, right? Um, so your psychic processes um, should be somewhere around that number as well. Solution two, stop allocating so many objects at once. This is the most important thing, um, and this is where I'm probably gonna spend the most of the time, uh, most of my time in this talk. Myth, shouldn't the GC just clean up all of our unused objects uh, after our job or action completes? Memory goes down, right? No. Garbage collection is very lazy. <laughs> uh, garbage collection doesn't work based on timers. It works based on thresholds. 
uh, there are various thresholds in your application that trigger, uh, in the Ruby VM, that trigger GC. It's not something that just runs constantly in the background, at least not the part that you care about. I'm, I'll get to that later. Uh, the, the sweeping phase of GC, the, the, the phase that actually frees memory or frees objects, uh, runs based on these thresholds. Um, the other reason why memory usage doesn't go down is something called heap fragmentation, which we're gonna get into. And uh, free isn't the free C uh, function doesn't actually always free memory back to the operating system. We're gonna get into that too. So there's a, there's a, very, there's a, a large number of reasons why memory usage does not go down. So let's talk about thresholds for, uh, for garbage collection. There are three main thresholds. Uh, the amount of slots that the Ruby VM has for objects can run out. So if we run out of slots, we need to get more slots. So that will trigger garbage collection. Ruby will attempt to first garbage collect its existing slots to find objects it doesn't need anymore. It'll get, throw those out of the slot, right? So then it gets, it gets a free slot. Uh, and then there are two uh, malloc thresholds. So this is, this is um, Ruby 2.0 one and up. Um, we have generational garbage collection. Uh, so we have an old object generation and a new object generation. Uh, those objects could allocate memory on the heap, um, and I'm gonna get to that in a minute. Uh, but when that memory that we've allocated crosses a certain threshold, we can trigger a GC. These thresholds move. So it's not, it's not a, uh, a, a single value, it's, it's, um, it, it multiplies. Um, so for example, with, with uh, free slots, uh, we start with 10,000 or whatever it is, I forget, um, and then uh, we run out of slots, right? And we need to grow the heap to get more slots. Uh, I think we multiply by a factor of 1.4 now, someone can correct me on that. Uh, but now, so uh, Ruby multiplies the size of the heap by 1.4, so now we have 14,000 slots, right? And then we fill up those slots, and if we need it again, we need more space, we multiply by 1.4 again, and so on and so forth. So that threshold can kind of move. Um, then we have heap fragmentation. Uh, reading the C source of gc.c is a little bit like opening the Ark of the Covenant, but um, what I've been able to glean out of it, we have something called the object space. And this is also sometimes called the heap in Ruby, but I, uh, I feel that it's a little bit confusing because um, there's some other stuff in the heap, so calling this part of Ruby the heap is a little weird, so I'm gonna call this the object space. In the object space we have pages, which are these columns, and we have slots. Um, each page has 408 slots for objects. Uh, pages are 16 kilobytes, and each slot is 40 bytes. So each slot contains something called an R value, and this is just the C internal name for it. Um, and it just kind of says, like, this is the object, this is its class, uh, and either here's what it is or here's a pointer to the data that, you know, to c contains all the data for this object. So uh, the problem with heap, well, what happens with heap fragmentation is, uh, so let's say I allocate 600,000 strings. So I have 600,000 slots, and then I don't need them anymore, so I get rid of them. But if I needed, like if I held a reference somewhere else to 10,000 of those strings, I have 10,000 slots somewhere that are still fill, full, right? Ruby cannot move objects between slots in pages, right? Because of the C extension API, any C extension can hold a pointer directly to the, where this R value is, uh, and if we move it, we'll break it. So if we move objects around in Ruby's object space, or if the garbage compactor, or if the garbage collector compacts uh, the Ruby object space, uh, it will break your C extensions and cause a seg fault. Um, so we don't want to do that, so we cannot, move we cannot move the pages, and we cannot move the objects in the pages. So people ask, like, why can't Ruby have a, a compacting GC? That's the reason. Um, and so you have these, and, and Ruby can only release a page, 16 kilobytes of memory, back to the operating system, can only call free on it, if there are no objects in the page, okay? So if there's even one object in, in, the, in the 408 slots in the page, we cannot give it back to the operating system. And uh, Aaron, Aaron Patterson's doing some work on this to like basically guess as to like, we should, all, we, the idea is he, we should put all old objects into a single page. So he wants to uh, have like a separate heap for like classes and modules versus like strings. Uh, because if classes and modules, we figure those will be around a long time. Um, 
So the, uh, that should reduce heat fragmentation. He'll probably talk about it tomorrow morning um, in his keynote. Um, I mentioned there's also another place that we allocate memory, and that's what I'll call the heap. Um, so I said an R value is only 40 bytes, right? So what happens if I have a 500 character string? That's not 40 bytes, that's, long, that's much larger than 40 bytes. Well, instead of uh, storing the string in, the, in that 40 byte slot, uh, we have a pointer to space on the heap. Um, Ruby calls malloc, allocates some space on the heap, um, and then, um, well, to put some space on the heap, that's it. Um, so we have two areas of, of where Ruby objects are kind of stored, right? Uh, this is where old, that old malloc and malloc limit comes in. Um, if we, uh, so that's where that threshold is. If, if we have more than X number of bytes allocated in this space, that can cause a GC um, uh, in different cases. Um, these values you can get uh, in GC internal constants. This is available in any Ruby process. So it tells you how big the slot is. That's, that's the size of an R value. And how many uh, heap, uh, how many pages, the, sorry, how many slots are in a page. Um, this changes based on your architecture. So this is, this is a 64-bit system. This will be different on different architectures. malloc and free are suggestions and not commands. So Ruby calls free and it says, hey, I have an empty uh, uh, object space page. I would like to return that to the operating system. It'll call free on the, on the address and say, I'm done. malloc can hold on to that. Uh, the, or the allocator, I should say, may hold on to that memory. Um, this depends on what allocator you're using, um, but it, it can sometimes put that memory into a free list, because the, the allocator's idea is like, well, programs allocate a lot of memory, so I should hold on to this memory because you might, you're just gonna ask me to allocate it again, right? Um, so people think that, well, if we're free in a memory page, my, my RSS, my, my, my memory should, should go down. Well, it's not necessarily the case because the allocator can hold on to that. Also, the operating system may not necessarily want that memory, may not reclaim it. Um, uh, Mac OS has like a thing called inactive memory, which is kind of like this. Um, so there's really no guarantee that any part in this memory stack here, the Ruby VM, um, the allocator, or the operating system is actually going to um, cause RSS to go down, even if you're trying to, if you're trying to call free and say it's, say it's available. Um, another uh, thing that can cause heat fragmentation in Ruby applications is uh, like, well, so we can't move pages around, right? So just like we can't move slots because that could break pointers from C extensions, we cannot move the page itself because uh, that would also change uh, memory addresses and, and break the, um, uh, break uh, the C, uh, C extensions. So if, for example, um, I allocate 600,000 strings, and at the, right before I did that, I allocated, I created a constant, or some non-garbage collected object. So I do that, allocate 600,000 strings, and then I create another new constant, right? So now I have, in memory, basically, constant, 600,000 empty pages, and a constant. This space in the middle, that gets, it'll get freed up, because I don't need those 600,000 strings anymore. This space in the middle is heap fragmentation. So this can be, you know, 16 kilobytes. If it's 600,000 strings, I mean, that's gonna be like 30 megs. Um, and when that space gets freed, the uh, malloc implementations usually have a lot of trouble with memory where we have, memory we need at this, at one side of the address space, and memory we need at the other side of the address space, and then there's a bunch of free memory in between. Allocators usually don't work very well with that. Um, what they like is the opposite. They like uh, all the free space to kind of be on one side of the address space. So if we have, we did our two, con we allocated our two constants, we created our two new constants and then allocated 600,000 strings, it's a lot easier for the allocator to deal with that. Um, but because Ruby al uh, applications are super complicated and we're doing all kinds of things all the time, uh, we can end up with these kind of like Swiss cheese looking heaps. And like I said, we can't move these memory addresses around, um, so we're stuck with that. And uh, that creates more memory usage than you would think is, is strictly necessary. If you back, make that diagram backwards, it's a French heap. <laughs> oh, wrong way. So this can cause long-term slow leaks. 
Um, even in an application that has constant memory needs, if we only really need 200,000 slots or whatever, um, this, this phenomenon of heat fragmentation can cause a slow increase in RSS usage. And that's not necessarily a leak, right? It's just heat fragmentation. It's just chaos created by the, the running of our program. Um, so we have, memory, me memory fragmentation, I should say, is, is usually like a small leak over time. Um, it's not some big, you know, 300 gigs every hour or whatever. This is that really slow, couple of kilobytes at a time memory usage you see um, at when your, pro when your uh, Ruby process is otherwise in a steady state. So the end result is that Ruby memory usage um, over time, that steady state of your process, um, is really the point of maximum memory pressure. What I mean by that is so this is our, this is our, our, uh, our me memory usage curve over time, right? And this is how much memory Ruby actually needs at any point in time. So, you know, you're, you're hitting a request here and then another one here and then, you know, Billy from accounting hits that CSV export action in admin controller, right? And that, need, that allocates a million objects. So over time, because free isn't really a, is a suggestion, not a command, because of heap fragmentation, um, we're gonna see long-term memory usage as the top of that peak, right? And this, all this free space is what malloc and Ruby are holding on to in expectation that Billy will go back and look for another CSV export. So the general idea here is we need to reduce the size of these peaks. And really you can only do that by allocating fewer objects. And that's like a whole nother conference talk for a whole nother day. Um, and it, like most of the time these are n plus ones. Uh, most of the time this is you created 3,000 active record objects at once um, and you need to fix that. So that's a whole nother talk for another day. Uh, can't talk about that right now. I can't tell you how to find these problems. You need to use an APM. Um, New Relic is not great for this, unfortunately. It's kind of like, New Relic is like tons of features, but none of them are really all that great. Um, <laughs> so I really like New Relic, I'm not, I'm not ragging on them. Um, uh, really, Scout and Skylight are better in this area. Skylight's profiler is really nice, um, and their memory uh, information is great. Scout works as well. Scout, I think, you can get for free, um, so I would recommend checking that out. It tells you how many uh, objects you're allocating uh, per controller action. Um, you can also use Memory Profiler and Oink if you're a cheap bastard doesn't want to pay anybody. Uh, so these are two Ruby gems. Um, Oink looks like this. No, I'm just kidding. Oink looks like this. Uh, so Oink tells you how many, uh, how much memory you're being is being allocated by each controller action. What controller actions are blowing out your heap? Uh, memory Profiler looks like this. It, it, memory Profiler just can tell you uh, what memory is allocated by a block of code and where it's being allocated. So what I usually do is like I look for al bad actions in, in Oink or in uh, my APM, and then I dig down with Memory Profiler. So I can put a before filter, after filter kind of thing, or um, Memory Profiler hooks into Rack Mini Profiler, which is another gem if you're familiar with that. Um, and then I use Memory Profiler to dig down. It's like, okay, exactly where is all this memory being, or what's, what's allocating all this memory? And you can also make your own with object space and gc.stat. Um, gc.stat is a, a, a thing you all have in every Ruby process. gc.stat has a, is a, just a hash with a bunch of information. Um, these keys are unfortunately kind of opaque and to really understand them, like you have to understand how gc.c works. But the simple ones are like, how many GCs are you doing? Um, and some of them, so some of them you'll get right out of the bat. And it's a great way for counting how many GCs are happening during an action. So the idea is, you know, you just have a before filter that checks what gc.stat says, and then an after filter to compare the difference, and you get the idea. Uh, object space count objects will do the same thing. These keys um, on the left are actual names of like internal MRI representations of your data. Um, but like there's like T underscore string, right? So if you're in a before filter and an after filter and you see in the after filter that object space count objects grew by 6,000 million strings, uh, you know that's where the problem lies and you can dig down a little bit more. And if all those fails, pull it in a rake task. Um, the idea is, is that if we're trashing the VM with a certain action, let's just move the action into another VM and then trash the VM when we're done. Um, Heroku makes this super easy because you can just Heroku run, rake, whatever, and then it'll throw away the VM when it's done. 
Um, so if you can move your big export tasks or you know, Billy from accounting's thing into a rake task or a sidekick um, worker, uh, that is gonna uh, reduce that size of that maximum peak and reduce the total size of um, your Ruby process. Throwaway VMs are much better than bloated VMs. Um, I also heard a really great idea from Mike who's sitting in the front row. He, uh, they move um, their bloated sidekick jobs into a different queue. Um, so, and then they have a, uh, that queue runs in a separate dyno on Heroku. So they kind of have like the bad job queue and, they, and that's the only one that gets blown out. So that's, that's another interesting idea. You can't really do that with web requests, but you can do it with jobs, right? Um, so how do we take out the trash? Uh, so gem file audit. Uh, so derailed, uh, written by Richard Seaman sitting in the front row. Um, it's an awesome tool, has a lot of cool benchmarks. I mainly use it for this one. Um, it basically just goes through each gem in your gem file uh, and tells you how much memory, or how much memory requiring that gem takes. Um, so uh, Richard used this to find a bug in the mind types gem, um, which is required by mail and therefore everyone's application. Uh, so this is super cool for checking out, like how much does that dependency really cost me? Because there's a myth that dependencies are free. And if I need you know, user auth, I should just throw device or omni auth into my project and I'll be fine. Uh, but dependencies are not free and uh, they, cost, they cost memory. Um, so going through it with derailed and checking how much that really costs you is awesome. Um, you could also require false for assets. So uh, we lost the assets group in like Rails 4.1 or whatever. Um, and that means that a lot of people are requiring gems like SAS, um, uh, Uglifier, et cetera, in production. And if you're pre-compiling your assets, like you should be, shame on you if you don't, uh, then that means you're requiring these dependencies you don't need in production and using up memory and wasting memory. Um, so Sprockets is requiring these things, is trying to require these things um, before it actually pre-compiles your assets. So you can save some memory by just not requiring them in your gem file and then always requiring them all the time. Um, you, this is maybe not, like I know this works with SAS, it may not work with other gems, so you're gonna have to like read the sprocket source and try it out yourself. Uh, and you can look in autoload.rb in sprockets to get an idea of what they will actually pick up. Okay, uh, J.E. Malik. Um, so you actually have a choice in memory allocator uh, in Ruby. Um, so like normally your program uses uh, the C, the glibc memory allocator, um, but you can use jmalloc. jmalloc was written by Facebook. Um, they said that their mission in jmalloc was to emphasize fragmentation avoidance and scalable concurrency support. Basically their PHP processes were like blowing out after you know, three days of, of, of being up. Um, and when you're at like serious scale like Facebook, you're looking for, you wanna keep your processes long running, right? Because if you're restarting your processes every four hours at Facebook scale, you're losing all that warm code, you're losing all those caches, uh, and you just can't do that. So you need, your processes need to be longer running. Um, so j they're trying to solve with Jay Malik exactly the problem that a lot of Ruby processes have. Um, so you can do this two ways. Uh, you can use the LD preload environment variable, and that just loads uh, J.E. Malloc before all other um, libraries. Or you can compile Ruby with configure dash dash with J.E. Malloc. Uh, and all these solutions, uh, I have like a, a, a gist at the end that I'm gonna link you to, um, so you can like find more details about this, because I know you're not gonna remember that, it's fine. You, I got notes for you. Solution five, use copy on write. So I don't really know anyone that doesn't use Puma or Unicorn in production right now, but I do know that some of them don't use preloading, and I think that's a mistake. Uh, I know it's kind of complicated to set up. I'm not gonna talk about how to do that today, but you really need to look at that option for your application because getting some advantage from copy on write memory is important. Um, copy on write increases shared memory. So we can have shared memory and private memory um, between processes. Uh, let's talk about that. So um, what preloading basically does in Puma or Unicorn is it will, do, it will load your application, call rails.initialize or whatever, and then fork after that point. Um, so what that means is all the memory that we allocated before forking can be shared between our two workers. And then after that, they have, they, they, uh, have their own private memory. Now this is a little complicated because basically from the perspective of these two workers, um, 
they think that they have their own memory. They're, they're not aware of this process. This is happening at the operating system level. Uh, and whenever one of these processes uh, attempts to read one of these memory locations, it gets to read it, that's fine. Uh, but when it tries to write to one of them, it copies it. That's why it's called copy on write. Um, so we want to avoid writing to shared memory. Unfortunately, it's kind of difficult to do that because a lot of writing to shared memory happens in the uh, garbage collection process. So you don't have a ton of control over that, uh, but um, the reality is that some copy on write is usually better than no copy on write. And there's a, uh, a little bit of a myth here that uh, the total memory usage of your, of your Ruby application is just the sum of the resident set size, that's RSS, um, in your uh, processes. But that's not true usually because of shared memory. So PS, I think, will give you uh, shared plus private RSS. Um, that, so just summing those up, we'll, you'll end up looking at it and saying, well, copy and write didn't save me any memory. You really gotta look into your mem whatever you're using to measure that memory usage with, um, because a lot of them won't split that out separately. What you really care about, right, is, okay, when I kill this worker, how much memory will be freed up, right? Uh, how much less RAM will I be using? And usually what, what you mean when you say that is how much private memory, how much private RSS am I using? Um, and you, so you just gotta make sure when you're measuring with these, with these memory tools that you're, that you're getting that correct. And it's really uh, surprisingly difficult um, to measure. Memory can be virtual or real, shared or private, resident or swapped, and a bunch of things that I really don't have time to cover in this talk. Um, there's a memory fact, which I will link to at the end of this talk if you wanna learn more about what these terms mean. Um, but I just really want you to understand that if you try copy on write with preload and you somehow like don't see a decrease in memory usage, that, that may just because, be because of the way you're measuring it and you need to dig into your tool a little more. And again, it isn't perfect, but it's a start. Um, because of changes to the garbage collection um, algorithm, copy and write effectiveness has been a little bit reduced since Ruby 2.0, uh, but it's still good, it's still a start. I recommend everyone give it a shot. Solution six, use a threaded web server. Um, Puma and Passenger Enterprise, 90% sure, are really the only ones you can do this with in production. Like Thin has a threaded mode, but like no one can really use it. Um, so this is a way of increasing concurrency with lighter memory usage, right? Threads use the same memory in our Ruby process, so we don't have to like allocate hundreds of more gigabytes when we, like when we fork. Um, this is what I think is a mini myth. I'm gonna go on a limb here. Most people think their applications are not thread safe. Uh, but the reality is that most people aren't really like writing crazy, super unsafe app code, I think. Um, that's been my experience anyway, you know. I'm sure people are like, oh, Nate, you're crazy. You're gonna create a bunch of threading bugs, telling people to do this. I do want you to give it a shot. Um, really the only way I know of right now to like have some idea of whether or not your app might be thread safe on production, um, because like, <laughs> Threads are, can feel a little bit like juggling, like all this crazy stuff. Like you don't know where the shared mutable state is. Um, the only way I know of fixing this right now, or like of, of getting an idea, is using Minitest Hell. Um, so you require Minitest Hell before your test run, and Minitest will run each new test in a new thread. So if that doesn't find a threading bug, I don't know what will. Uh, it only works with Minitest, obviously. Maybe RSpec has a similar thing that I don't know about, but I don't use RSpec, so whatever. Um, solution seven, keep Ruby and gems up to date. Um, pr uh, authors like Richard are working hard all the time on the performance of their libraries. Please help them by running bundle update every once in a while. Um, and uh, so my general recommendation here is that people should be on Ruby 2.2 plus or Rails 4.2 plus. 2.2 had incremental GC. Uh, 2.3 doesn't really have like any crazy performance improvements you need for upgrade. It fixes a memory leak in prepend, if you're using prepend anywhere. Uh, but really no huge performance upgrades, so I don't think it's a huge uh, problem if you're not on that. And Rails 4.2 plus, because in Rails 4.2 we got this thing called adequate record for caching um, active record queries, which is awesome. I would watch out for Ruby 2.4 when that drops because it's gonna have a faster fast, uh, hash implementation and a ha faster regex um, implementation. Uh, and uh, it's gonna have some additional control over the free, number of free slots that we can give back to the operating system. Um, so I think that's gonna be an interesting development for performance. I would definitely uh, upgrade to that as soon as I could. Solution eight, tune malloc. Um, so there's a couple things we can give, we can tell malloc to change its behavior. The most interesting one is malloc arena max. Um, for people running threaded web servers in production, so if you're running 
Puma with threads, passenger enterprise. Um, I think this is an interesting setting you need to look at. Basically, when uh, you have a threaded application, malloc, glibc malloc, uh, will, the default malloc, um, will create these things called arenas. And what it's trying to do is reduce contention uh, for memory reading and writing between threads. So it creates arenas every time it detects a contention uh, for memory access between threads. The problem is, is that the default um, uh, limit, the default limit for the number of arenas it can create is like something like four or eight times the number of cores. So that can end up being a lot of memory, right? Uh, so changing this value from 64 or whatever it is on your machine to a number like two or three uh, can uh, reduce the total amount of memory usage uh, of a Ruby process. Uh, it will also decrease performance, right? Because what, what malloc is trying to do is reduce thread contention. So by decreasing the number of arenas, we are increasing contention, right? And which will cause uh, waiting. Um, so there, there is a performance decrease. But for some people, that's not as important as the amount of uh, memory usage that they can you know, get down. Um, the, the performance decrease for changing this value to two or three is like sometimes in the neighborhood of 10%, and it can save 25% of the memory usage. So if that's an interesting trade-off for you and you run a threaded web server, I would check that out. Um, there's some, a great uh, Heroku article about that, which I'm pretty sure I linked to in the notes. Um, there's a whole list of other things you can tune in Malopt. Um, and you can tune all of these things with environment variables. Um, so if you know a little bit about C and you know a little bit about allocators, I would check out malopt and check out um, what you can tune with environment variables to try to reduce some memory usage. It's very interesting. Uh, mem uh, Malloc Arena Max is the only one that I currently kind of like recommend people take a look at. But if you know your C, I would definitely check out um, in malopt what you can mess with. And then the final solution is tuning your GC. Uh, so actually, I don't recommend you do that. <laughs> Uh, if you can read gc.c and understand what, these, uh, ver what the environment variables you can set in there actually do, I, I'd say go ahead, give that a shot. But a lot of people find these like Ruby GC settings on the internet and just like copy paste. And the problem is, is the Ruby GC has changed so much in the last three years that settings are out of date, um, settings may not be appropriate for your application, and you can really shoot yourself in the foot with this stuff. Uh, you can really mess up your garbage collector. Um, so GC tuning can fix too many free slots being in the object space, it can fix slow startup times, and it can fix uh, too many or too few GCs. If you don't have one of those problems, you shouldn't be looking at tuning GC in my opinion. Um, all, and the amount of memory you can uh, save from reducing the number of free slots is really not that much. It's probably 5% of your total um, application's usage. And you can really mess up your application if you get these numbers wrong. So um, don't recommend you do that yet. I think we need some more up-to-date documentation on what these things actually do um, that's accessible to a normal person um, or a normal Ruby programmer that may not know uh, how the GC works or whatever. Um, so if you see this thing and you're like, oh, I should try these variables that I copy-pasted, like, please don't do that. All right, so that's all I had to talk about. Um, tomorrow, uh, I'm, there's gonna be a performance birds of the feather meeting um, at 1.15 p.m. If you have questions, I'd love to see you there. Uh, I have an entire course on tuning the performance of Rails applications. It's at railspeed.com. It has 18 hours of video with interviews and screencasts and over 350 pages of content covering front-end performance, Ruby performance, uh, database performance, and how to measure and profile and, and do all that great stuff. Um, if you've read my blog online, this is what it looks like if you recognize that. Um, it's being moved to speedshop.co right now, um, which has been a fun project. Like, like my speedshop website, it's all 10 kilobytes and like everything's inline. It's like super performance optimized. So I'd love to talk about that too if you want to like ask me about it. Um, anyway, thanks. The slides and the notes for this talk are on my Twitter handle, at Nate Berkepec. Um, you can find me at speedshop.co and railspeed.com. Uh, is there any questions? I don't know how much time I have. Yeah. Yeah, so Puma Worker Killer, Richard's project. Like, it's awesome that it exists, but again, a lot of what, it, what I see when people use Puma Worker Killer is they're, they're getting like 30 instance restarts per hour. Um, they're, they're restarting their workers 30 times per hour. Um, Puma Worker Killer is not a tool for like re cramming 30 workers into a single one gigabyte dyno, right? 
it's really a, meant to be a tool for that one dyno that gets out of control and like, you know, has two gigabytes of memory usage. Um, so I think that worker killers are a very sharp instrument and uh, I would prefer that if you're gonna use one of those, that at first you don't, uh, not like permanently, but d turn it off and run that process for 24 hours, see what the member usage is like at that point, and then use that information to set that limit for Puma Worker Killer, okay? Don't just set that number out of nowhere without knowing exactly how much memory you're actually using in the first place. Um, they are necessary tools, I think, but I think that a, 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 a well-architected application usually doesn't have to, to deal with those problems, and Puma Worker Killer and Unicorn Worker Killer are really more Band-Aids than real solutions. And Richard's nodding his, head, nodding his head, so I think he agrees. So the question was like, so I talked about how constants or you know, basically old objects, objects that can't immediately be, be garbage collected can cause heap fragmentation, and is there anything we can do about that? Uh, honestly, I don't really think so. All you can really do is not allocate tons of objects at once. All you can really do is not blow out the heap uh, the object space to huge proportions in the first place. Um, so if you're, if, if you're, uh, heap fragmentation will be lower if, for example, the maximum amount of allocations that happen in a controller is 300,000 objects rather than 5 million, um, which is a number I've seen, actually I've seen 18 million. Um, so just reducing that max allocation number, the max amount of uh, memory that needs to be allocated at a single time is probably the most important thing you can do to reduce, to reduce heat fragmentation. There are really none um, as far as like you as application developers are concerned. Um, you can go read the issue on Ruby Core as to why it was not included in Ruby Core. Um, basically, I think the developers feel like they don't want to hitch themselves to a big uh, open source project that they don't control. Um, I think their idea was that they would basically like bring all of J.E. Malik code into the Ruby core repository like they do with OpenSSL, and it's like a big project, and I understand they don't want to do that. Um, but from an application developer's perspective, um, there really aren't any drawbacks. It's not going to like cause random seg faults. Um, you can use it, ah, I should mention, you can use it on Heroku. So I, I maintain a Heroku build pack for adding J.E. Malik to your Heroku dyno. And I would like more people to try that. It's not super battle tested at this point, but um, you can like, you know, spin up a new dyno and, and add our build pack in um, and then try J Malik with your application to, to give that a shot. Uh, like what would I do differently if that, if either one was the problem? So the, what, what would I do, differ do differently if the problem was many small objects versus many, a single large object? I don't know, I think either, it's really the same problem. I think most people have the latter problem. Most people have the problem of my controller has a million active record objects it needs at once. I can't say I've seen, and I think it's a little bit easier to deal with on the fragmentation side because when you think of fragmentation as a problem, right, it's about the space between the objects. So that, that is necessarily bigger if there's 600,000 objects, right? Like if there's, there's many, if there's many opportunities for each of those 600,000 objects to be not garbage selected, to stay around, and then that causes that heap space, right? With one single object, there's, no, there's only the, the, the beginning and the end of that object in the address space, so it doesn't cause as much fragmentation. Um, but like I said, I normally see the latter problem. The main problem is that, so okay, the question was like, my, I used my example for 600,000 objects that like I kept 10,000 of them around and that's what caused the fragmentation. What if I didn't keep those 10,000 object references anywhere and I just let the 600,000 objects go away? Um, I actually have some demo code that I'm not gonna run right now that actually does that. And what you actually see in reality is that that still causes a lot of heat fragmentation. The reality is, is I, I haven't used like Valgrind or any crazy memory heap um, analysis tools to figure out exactly why, but um, that can still cause heap fragmentation. I think what, what's happening is there's memory being allocated for other reasons after we allocate those 600,000 strings, and that's creating a new heap page or memory uh, access somewhere, and we're still getting that, all that um, free space. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I think that script, that test script is, is in the notes, and if it's not, I'll add it. Uh, but you can mess around with that and play with like what causes fragmentation and what doesn't. Again, it depends on the allocator. Like J malloc deals with that case a lot better than, than glibc malloc does. No, uh, there are no other allocators right now that I would recommend. There's tc malloc, uh, but I found it a lot harder to set up and I, I found the results not as good as j malloc. 
Um, and there are like some like uh, closed source allocators that I haven't tried, so maybe one of those is okay. But JMalloc is good, it's free, it's battle tested by Facebook. Um, and it's also battle tested by Discourse, which is a huge Rails application. So um, that's currently the only one I think people should really be looking at super hard. Anyone else? All right, cool. Um, I'm happy to talk about performance war stories. If you have any questions about Ruby performance at all, I'm happy to talk to you. So, and hopefully see you tomorrow.